Hello everyone and welcome to another video in our series I Formulate Revisited. My name is David Calvert and just over seven and a half years ago together with Jim Bullock we formed I Formulate Limited and since then we've made many conference presentations and due to the very strange times we're living in at present we thought it might be a good idea to reflect and go back and look at some of those presentations and see if the comments we made at that stage are still valid. So in this video, I go back to a presentation I made in 2014 at the International Probiotics Association World Congress, which took place in Athens. And the title of the presentation was The Art of Probiotic Formulation. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about, obviously, about probiotics as we go through the presentation. Um, but that was the title slide. It's always good in these series. I think it's, it's worth actually looking back at how we um, used to format our presentations to make them stand out. Uh, what you're seeing at present is our clean format, which we think works well, but I thought I'd just show you the title slide as it was then. So there it was, and, and actually we've done worse. Um, it wasn't too bad, I think, and it, it, it stood out. And um, probiotics, for those of you who don't actually know about them, are the, the healthy bacteria that people talk about inhabiting our gut and how um, you can put those into products um, that then will help to improve your health by uh, the gut microflora. So that's what probiotics are, but they, um, they wanted to talk a little bit about formulation. Um, but what I was asked to do and what we did and, and what you'll see today is, is a mixture of presentation come workshop. Um, so as with many of these things, um, there are some slides that have been repeated and we'll skip over those if you've seen them before and then some of those specific to the application. So hopefully you'll enjoy this video and uh, let's just go over what we started with in terms of a title and of course program. So had to do some introductions and then um, the audience very large congress um, maybe probably thought they knew what formulation was but it was always worthwhile with this audience um, and, and any new audience that isn't specific to formulate it's just what is formulation and where it's used talked a little bit about open innovation and, and that was a theme throughout the congress before i spoke actually we then had an interactive session and uh, you can actually have your own interactive session with yourself and, and jot down some ideas on some of the tasks that we gave a couple of the groups. Um, and we then gave some feedback and formulation technologies for probiotics. And um, I'm gonna probably focus an awful lot more on the last end. Um, the rest of it you'll have seen before. So let's just get going. So I always think that people believe that formulators have a silver bullet and uh, wanted really to get across to the audience that that is something we didn't have. Um, sometimes you get very lucky and you find some magic waffle dust, as we call it, that you can add into a formulation. But most of the time that doesn't exist and you need to work at combinations and you need a fair bit of trial and error. So there is no magic wand or some silver bullet I said to the audience that I could produce for them that would solve all of their problems. I also had to say, and it's difficult to believe, I know some of those, some of you who've met me will, will say, no, he must be Superman. Well, I'm not, and I'm also not probiotic man. So the idea was to try and just bring across that formulators are good scientists. They just don't wave a magic wand and, and there is um, a lot of hard work and thought needs to go into developing a new formulation in any area and in specific probiotics. So we do try to do something a little light-hearted at the beginning to get the attention of our audience. And um, at the time of the presentation, there were some issues with an organization from the probiotic, for, for probiotics producers with an organization in Europe, and, and those issues still exist, called EFSA, which stands for the European Food Safety Authority. So I wanted to get the audience to try and imagine a different world. And this world is a brave new world. And in this brave new world, and I asked them to keep their eyes shut, there was an abbreviation called 
EFSA. But in this brave new world, EFSA stood for something entirely different. It stood for everything's fabulous and sunny in Athens. And I do remember one of the senior scientists of EFSA, even he smiled when I mentioned that. So that tried to get the audience's attention. Um, but then we got on to the serious matter about what were we going to do. Before we did that, obviously, and, and many of you hopefully will know all of this, this was the slide we used at the time, and, and it's similar to the other ones in terms of what we do. I'm not going to dwell on that because you'll see that in many other videos that we do and in many presentations that we make. So if you're interested, you can obviously just pause that or you can go and look on our websites, but it, it gives you an idea of what we do and we still do. And what is probiotic formulation? And this slide can be moved across many industries. So what is formulation? It's enabling. It allows small quantities and, and probiotics are added in small quantities to be delivered safely and effectively to the target site by combining with other components. Formulation can also obviously be a composition, which is the in this case would be the probiotic and the formulants. And sometimes those formulants might be called prebiotics which is food for probiotics, and it can be a processing step. And, and in probiotic formulation, all of those are important elements. Um, you've got to try and get it delivered safely and effectively and intact or available to the target site. And that's one of the major challenges for probiotics, and you must be able to process them. So why to formulate and, and the issue for the probiotics industry with EFSA at the time and, and still going on um, is trying to make health claims for probiotics. And that's an issue in Europe. So EFSA was saying that the studies that the industry was using to justify those claims just weren't good enough. They either weren't specific in terms of the strain or the evidence was not significant enough and, and many other reasons. And if you if you Google EFSA and probiotics, I'm sure you'll be able to find out um, much more about that if you're interested. Um, you formulate to make something available. So if this is to try and enhance, if a probiotic is there to try and enhance the availability in the gut, it must get to the gut and it must then release its payload. In essence, the probiotic in the gut, it mustn't go all the way through. Um, quality standards and product stability, an issue with many probiotic products is important. Cost, obviously, and, and probiotics, although they attract a certain margin, they're still cost reliant. You must be able to manufacture them. And obviously the regulatory requirements links quite intimately with the performance and claims. And again, a familiar slide for those of you who've been before, but what have they got in common across many different industries, multiple in ingredients, phases, they're complex, they sometimes have particles, sometimes droplets, sometimes both. They all almost certainly have surfaces and interface, and in many ways, a lot of them do encapsulation, release and delivery. And again, that bottom one, very relevant to probiotics and how you formulate a probiotic product. So, we did and we still do and will continue to do is to say that there are opportunities from other industries and in formulation in specific there are lots of um, opportunities to use an idea in one industry in another industry it's used just in so many industries and every product you may get will be formulated we've got what they have in common on the previous slide um, you need a structure but um, Often people just stick in their own particular area and they work in their own industry and the knowledge that they have is within their own company and that is often very good, but they're a little bit closed. So we try, still do, get people to say who outside your industry might have a similar challenge and if they don't have the time or the opportunity or the, the links to be able to do that, then we do that for many clients and look at how they've tackled the challenge and then come back and apply it to the specific challenge in that industry or in our clients' industries. So this way of looking outside of the box, if you want to call it that, is important in formulation. So again, a familiar slide, but what do people do in other industries? They try and make it more soluble, more bioavailable, 
obviously that's relevant to, to uh, probiotics. They want to stabilize the active substance, a probiotic from chemical or physical degradation, and that's very important for those. They want to improve the delivery, and that's done in agrochemicals and in many other industries. The release, it has to be released. And uh, a probiotic person might not have thought, well, what have I got to do with pesticides? Well, they want a certain release over a certain time. And farmers need to go until it gets to the right part of the GI tract. And that's important, obviously, also for probiotics. They need to be compatible. Uh, taste and, and probiotics obviously go into many food products. So taste is important in pharmaceutical formulations, particularly in children's parenteral formulations. They want to taste mask. Um, but in probiotics, they might want the taste to be there. In fact, they do, obviously. Uh, and then there are issues with photostabilization. But again, it's trying to get across a lot of the challenges that were in other industries that you may not think are relevant to probiotics actually are. And this was a phrase, and it, it relates back to everything I've just spoken in the last few, that was used by a number of people in the Congress. They said, stop working in silos. And that was one of the uh, issues they highlighted for the whole of the industry. And I just um, thought that's a good saying and that's something that we believe in and that they should really be looking towards. So we asked them to stop working in silos. So this is a, uh, a slide I've used before in the Open Innovation one, the first in the I Formulate Revisited series, and it, it just talks about how open innovation is and what the benefits are. And uh, I won't dwell on that if you're interested in a better, uh, a lengthier explanation of that. Look at the one about open innovation in this series or just follow some of the links on open innovation and in particular Chesbra, who's one of the pioneers of that. talked in the first in the I Formulate Revisited series about open innovation and some of the issues and IP and secrecy is very important and there were lots of um, commercial people in the audience and uh, they could see how that was uh, going to be an issue with open innovation but there are ways around that. We then went on to talk a little bit about a targeted innovation workshop that I thought was relevant to those in the audience and, and we were commissioned um, at that time by a large pharmaceutical company to assist with trying to get them to move forward and get their own people to think about out of the, going out of the box. And it was ideas, technologies, contacts and project building around a certain theme. They had a champion within the organisation, which was excellent, um, and they thought there must be an opportunity to leverage cross industry expertise for mutual benefit and it had links to technical expertise in the food and be beverage sector. So they asked us to try and see if we could get together a consortia and interest groups that could be used for some future collaborative projects and to do that in a workshop environment initially. So what did we do? Well, we looked at the theme and, and we, we found people who knew what they were talking about in that specific silo, perhaps. There were also individuals and there were technologies and, and we were looking at food and pharma. We were able to say that and we were looking academia, but academics who had a reputation of working with industry, large and small companies. And, and we wanted to bring things that were new to the client. We didn't just want to bring them the people they knew already because that would have been a waste of their time and money to a large degree. In the first stage, we did a report and we came up with recommendations about who would be the type of people and organisations we'd want to bring along to the workshop. We agreed a format. Um, the client hosted that workshop, which was by invitation only uh, from iFormulate, and there were some additional attendees within the organisation and a couple of very good academics who were invited by the client. And then we provided the client with a final report and follow up on how um, some of the ideas could be taken further. So that workshop, there were 25 attendees. We got it over and done within a day. Um, there were scientists from the client company, as I said, there were academics, research institute with a, a primary focus on food. And there were some innovative small and medium enterprises and some of the pharma collaborators such as contract research organization and actually some of the big pharma companies. 
we did a structured networking session. Uh, wasn't quite speed dating, but it wasn't far away from that, just so that it broke the ice and people knew who was in the room. Um, again, an element of trust. You don't want to come up with a great idea if you think it's somebody who might be regarded as a competitor. We provided together with the client an introduction to the theme and why it was relevant to the industry. And then we, we had two smaller themes which were, settled, uh, were tackled in smaller group sessions. So again, almost like challenges. Um, they brought the theme and they gave some more detail. Um, they talked about how they had been approaching this, these topics and then people were able to come up with idea generation and we started to classify those into group. And then after those uh, individual small group sessions, we had a large group wrap up session and that was to try and get some common themes and to say, okay, you've had a day together now, do you think you want to go any further? And we were pleased to say that they did want to go a lot further. So it was beneficial, they got lots of ideas, lots of good contacts. Um, they did lots of offline. Um, there were, and we know that there were projects came out of this. The three themes and members came together for an R&D collaboration, which was the subject of a grant application by the project consortia. So from what the client wanted right at the beginning of the um, workshop, we actually achieved and delivered that and, uh, and much more besides, I believe. So, and this seems strange to leave this in a webinar, but then after giving an idea of, well, how can you work outside of your silos to um, the audience? Uh, we then, and it was a large hall, and they said they, they weren't sure if this would work, but um, we did an interactive session. And uh, I think you can actually do the interactive session as well, but I'll explain that when we get there. So, I wanted to introduce the idea of formulation formats and talk to them about well, what is a, in our definition of formulation format, and that can be tablets, powders, liquids, which again, relevant to a probiotic, could be a drink, a juice, dairy base, a yogurt, some oil suspensions, could be granules, could be sachets, gels, lozenges, gums, and pearls. And these are all formats that I used actually for probiotics. Um, so I wanted to introduce that um, idea or concept to the audience. And then we started to say, so now you're gonna do some work. So I said that really you could maybe split them into two halves. There were solid formats and there were liquid formats. So what we did was we split the audience down the middle and we said, okay, you're gonna look at solids, you're gonna look at liquids. Quizzical looks from everyone, but then went on to explain, and this is what you're going to do in that group. So you're gonna to start to think if you're doing solids or liquids, at what ingredients are needed to deliver a solid or a liquid probiotic product. And an important element is, is why. And, and often people will throw out the name of an ingredient, they'll call it a chemical or they'll have a trade name. And then you say, so why is that added? And it might well be, well, we always did. Mm, well, maybe that's not quite the right answer. And if you say why they're added, do you know how to test that what you think they're being added for is actually true? I asked them to think about what issues they could foresee from the ingredients that were put in there. And, and maybe, and, and this was a bit of a push, but how would they address those? So now, strange as it may seem, you could actually do that session. So you could pause this video um, and you could take 10 or 15 minutes. I think we gave them 25 minutes and, and I wandered from one group to another to facilitate that. Um, but you could take 10 or 15 minutes to go back and think, okay, I'm gonna do solids and then try and answer some of these questions. And it, maybe you don't have to do it for probiotics, maybe do it for your own industry. But if you have a solid format, what ingredients are needed? Why are they needed in your industry? How do you test their working? What issues could you foresee? And how can you address those? So for those of you who'd like to do that, just pause the video here, come back in 15, 20 minutes, or when you've had enough, and then restart the video. For the rest who don't particularly want to do this at this stage, then we'll just move on. So as with all um, 
sessions we we had a little bit of feedback so people came up and many of the ideas were very good and we we gave them feedback on that and then then we thought we'd do a little bit about some of the specific challenges with probiotics so common ingredients that we expected them to come up with diluents solids and liquids um lubricants uh, an example of some of the things used there are magnesium stearate we thought they would come up with color in, in both solids and liquids to a large degree. And, and how would they test whether the color was working? Well, they'd use maybe a spectrophotometer or they'd use their eye, uh, but then they'd also maybe do that over time. We thought they might say there'd be some binders. It could be a rice maltodextrin, microcrystalline cellulose, and, and how do you test maybe that they're working in a tablet? Maybe you need to do some uh, friability tests, for example. It could be a coating agent and a sweetener Again, how would you test that they're working or a flavor? You might start to use a, a panel for that. Anti-caking agent, well, maybe to stop the solid going together, you might then have uh, some anti-caking agent to stop it. And that would really only be tested to a large degree in, uh, in manufacturing or at pilot scale. You might have a viscosity modifier. And I highlighted methylcellulose and xanthan gum that they may have heard of, but not really understood what that meant. Uh, and again, I talked to think about viscosity and rheology and how they were both different, obviously. Um, in probiotics, they may actually have some other probiotics and they may have some prebiotics in their product. And, and why are they there? Prebiotics are food for the probiotics. It's, it's an interesting concept. Um, but why are they there? Uh, and then how do you check that they're still working? Um, is the product failing because the prebiotics that were needed for the probiotics have degraded or is it the probiotic itself that isn't degrading and isn't surviving any process that you're putting it through? So that was the type of things that I put down in advance and expected them to come up with. And we talked through then their ideas and, and your ideas as well. I'm sure you've got many different ones in there, and particularly if you've used a different industry, then you'll have some different ideas. Stability is an issue with probiotics and uh, wanted to talk a little bit about with the audience what they really mean by stability and it being a detectable, significant and undesirable change over a relevant time period. And we talked a lot about what the relevant time period is for probiotics uh, and for other products. And in some cases, it can be quite short shelf life within a certain amount of time, or it could be a longer shelf life, depending on where it is. Um, but we, we cover this in quite a number of presentations and uh, I make no apologies for putting it back into the into this presentation as well because it is so important. And then the, the one I've really just talked about, if you have a change that's undetectable, insignificant or is over a longer time period, it's irrelevant once you've started to define that. And accelerated and predictive stability testing is used, is important, um, but isn't the be all and end all of stability. Um, in some cases, you you accelerating something that doesn't happen um, so quite often you have infamous shelf life tests as well as accelerated testing um, but you you have some good um, standard procedures in many different industries for this but then let's talk about people say probiotics were unstable so what did that mean so i i said okay so what what does it, if your probiotic is unstable, what do you really mean through the body? Is that where we're talking about it being unstable? So saliva can degrade products. So do they mean that it's unstable to saliva? Do they mean as it goes through the stomach, the acid environment of the stomach is where it's unstable? Um, and then posing the question, of course, can it be too stable? And, and the answer to that is, well, yes, if it, if you have your probiotic and it just goes all the way through and is then not released in the gut and it just passes straight through the body, well, people have paid money for something that's literally gone to waste. So it's all about delivery at the right place at the right time. So a probiotic can be too stable. But also, what about how you're processing it? And probiotics used in a lot of baking products, and there was a lot of talk at the Congress about that. So 
is the stability issue you talk about your probiotic is it really before it's even got to the consumer is it in the process is it pre-mixing mixing is it forming is it baking what does baking mean well, it normally means temperature to me can even be cooling it could even be packing and how, how what packaging material you use so you've got to consider the whole life cycle of product um, including the process um, before but as you're defining really what stability is and then shelf life so you might have made it you might have formed it um, but then you've got a supply chain still before it even reaches the consumer and then you've got a shelf life in store before the consumer buys it and then that stability at the consumer may be in their fridge but um, maybe then going through the body so there's a whole new a load of elements and, and I like this cartoon in particular um, takes me back to days as a student where perhaps you should be buying milk where it says best before May the 9th yeah, it's still pretty good on May the 13th um, but if it's June the 4th then why is this still in their fridge just makes me smile but brings across that there are different ways of looking at stability and in those three slides we've tried to do that timelines and shelf life what is a, an appropriate timeline and, and in many cases it's regulated pharmaceutical and agrochemicals have specific timelines in specific areas where it must be stable and in food well it will vary sometimes it's just arbitrary people put it on and, and they think about it certainly in industrial and in fast moving consumer goods they put on a shelf life because it's needed it's not regulated but it's needed to ensure that the product reaches the consumer in a state to use or the end user in a state that is used how do they decide on that well data is important when it's arbitrary a lot of it is experience and market requirements and sometimes you have to say that that you just do it and you you really do use your experience combined with some data you often if you're looking for a, a three-year shelf life or a two-year shelf life you really can't sit around for two years you have to take a certain element i guess of risk and this was something i thought brings that across quite well so we do precision guesswork so we don't know for certain we can't consider every contingency if you think of a supply chain for many things you can't consider what every temperature regime it's going to be how it's going to be cycled etc but you can put some good guidelines in that say the risk of it not um, being unstable sufficiently unstable is there so precision guesswork is is not a bad phrase to use sometimes So then try to take the audience through what were the um, some common stability challenges and, and I thought pharmaceuticals where they're looking at biologic active ingredients and peptides um, has some relevance to a large degree they need to be stable to heat and extreme pH they're going through the stomach let's say uh, chemical degradation and it needs to be delivered to the active site and then it needs to become unstable also um, you need to keep small particles quite well dispersed you don't want them aggregating or else they won't be able to, to lock on to their target for example um, and taste is important in pharmaceuticals so I think most people thought there was some relevance but I was trying to get across about how relevant it can be in terms of a formulation concept and then in agrochemicals and at that stage and this trend has continued the the bio pesticides natural extracts sometimes peptides enzymes proteins but living organisms um, are being used in agrochemicals and and they present similar challenges um, and, and bacillus bacteria are, are used in that and continue to being used and, and this one was just about bacillus subtilis at the time talking about how it secretes a, an antimicrobial peptide suppresses toxins secreted by a root allowing the beneficial bacteria to colonize the soil around the roots um, but it needs to be alive to do that just like a probiotic needed to be alive so how they deliver that has some relevance to what the probiotic industry was trying to achieve and in cosmetics there's a trend towards these natural ingredients that term natural is often used and misunderstood or not truly defined but um, the organic cosmetics movement 
parallels to that in food and we've certainly even since then seen the the recent drives towards vegan and vegetarian diets um in cosmetics they use a lot of natural extracts polymers and other plant derived compounds and and the issue there and the real challenge is that as opposed to a chemical they are not particularly well defined they're mixtures and depending upon where it comes from there is a certain amount of variability in fact a lot of variability um, stability of any natural ingredients is also an issue and, and that stability can be influenced by pH, by chemicals, heat, light, microbiological um, and sometimes and, and maybe they get away with it I don't know if I'm allowed to say that but maybe they do in cosmetics that the loss of efficacy is not always apparent I mean if it smells or it's a colour and it's preservative and it's bugged then um, you obviously do see it but sometimes if it's a moisturizing effect um, then it might not always be obvious to the consumer that it's not working as well as it could um, and quite often cosmetic products some of the newer ones that they, they talk about a regime that takes weeks or months and uh, it could be quite expensive and it could all be down to it not being a stable formulation um, so they have issues with stability that they can see sometimes and sometimes they can't So I was hoping that the answer to this question from the audience are probiotics the only products with stability product problems well no um, pharmaceuticals agrochemicals cosmetics and we can go on there are lots more that have a, a diff of the same type of stability challenges and therefore it's worth looking at what they do so looking at another silo so I then went on to provide some examples of in how industries, those industries are approaching those challenges. Well, to solve probiotic stability, and this was a bit cheeky, but you can sometimes get lucky. So um, it's a Kerry product from Ganadin BC30, it's called, and, and it's spore forming. And that spore forming shell does help it to make extreme, make BC30, which is patented, um, a um, very hardy, probiotic so it survives going through the gut and it can survive many many processes and because of that it's had a lot of success at that time and continues to have a lot of success so um, in a way they were lucky but they also found a product that did it and, and therefore the formulation solution is not necessarily needed and here's some of the uses from uh, by Ganade and Biotech at the time gave permission for us to talk about the teas that they were used in, some ice cream, um, some some uh, chocolate products that are in there, uh, and, and, uh, and another product there. There are a lot more if you go to, if you search for Ganade on BC30, you'll find lots of those. But another way to... Um, look at that is to formulate it and, and this came from Capsigel so they put in a lot of probiotics are delivered in capsule format uh, and for the capsules you have um, options of using gelatin or acid resistance hypromellose um, capsules so they will resist the acid they used a certain strain uh, they simulated the stomach media with sodium chloride pepsin and uh, acid which gave a pH of 1.2 and then they simulated what the small intestine looks like in terms of bile salts, pancreatin, sodium hydroxide and a change in pH. And the diagram you'll see there is, is the sinker containing the capsule and how they evaluated this. It was on a shaker um, just in water. Then they put it into the stomach conditions and then they put it into the small intestinal conditions after certain time periods. So the results, they looked at it after 30, 60 minutes in the stomach and 120, 180 and 240 minutes in the intestine. And I guess um, the graphs on the right show that if you just used the gelatin capsules, um, then initially you obviously had a high probiotic count, but then it, it had literally gone after 30 minutes. So there was no probiotic count at all. Whereas if you uh, looked at the DR caps, um, you could see that um, it actually survived all the way through to the intestine. So not 30 and 60, 
um, and then actually started to degrade in the intestine, which is the T equals 240 minutes. And that's obviously what you wanted it to happen. So it was shown that the DR caps that they used survived the uh, stomach, but then started to release in the intestine. And they also scored them visually, which you, you can see uh, in that respect, some of, the, some of the scores over here. But again, if you look on the Capsi Gel site and search for probiotics, I'm sure you'll find lots more. Other ways that I brought across for industries is encapsulation. It's often thought about it and, and the why. Well, we've talked about that. And encapsulation can be molecular. And we're going to talk a little bit about cyclodextrins and some of the solid formats you can use, metal organic frameworks. And it can be nano, micro and macro. Um, I've spoken in previous presentations and Jim has about liposomes. So we're not going to talk about the liposomes, which is on far right side top of this slide. Um, but we will talk about some of the other options. So these are cyclodextrins that are used in drug delivery and they're uh, also used for flavors, particularly the beta cyclodextrins. Um, there's also, they've been used with various other ones and they can also photostabilize drug active. So the idea here is that the, the active slots into the slot, in, into the hole in the cyclodextrin and then it's trapped. Um, and again, lots of use and, and obviously there are some cost implications but the thing here is that they are being used in flavor so and food so beta cyclodextrin is being widely used zeolites which can be naturally occurring or also can be specifically synthesized um, and this was just a, a paper all about um, combining indica with with the zeolite and, and the pigment that was normally not very stable was, was stable against light and temperature. Um, and it's how the indico then associated with the zeolite. So again, it's, it's a little bit like a cage. You're trapping something within a cage. Microencapsulation. Uh, we did talk about liposomes, but I've, I've pulled it from this, this specific revisited presentation. Um, how you can do coacivation, so you can start with an oil phase with the active is in the solution of the hydrocolloid. Um, you precipitate that onto the oil phase by, by doing something either anti a different solvent or changing the pH or reducing the temperature. This helps you to form a polymer-polymer complex when you add a, another hydrocolloid and then you, you start to cross-link it and therefore you get that active um, entrapped. And you can either deliver that as a... Um, as a liquid formulation with the capsules in, or you can dry them and then you get micro capsules 10 to 250. Obviously not as simple as it's described there, lots of process elements that you need to take care of, but a fairly common way of encapsulating products. Solid state solutions to encapsulate, and this is you now done an awful lot with hot melt extrusion or with extrusion so that you, um, you you disperse it molecularly, not by particle in a solid carrier matrix, and then you can start to um, delay how it's released. So here we have um, a drug, itraconazole, and it's been um, encapsulated, I guess, and you can see how it's still available and, and still releasing into the blood, whereas there's, there's nothing available when it was the crystalline one. And that was using a product from BASF. Many of them are out, but you'll be able to find that one if you need that. So that's a, what they call a solid, um, a solid state solution. And, and there are different ways of producing that as well. Air is one of the cheaper um, ways of trying to solve a formulation um, problem. Um, ice cream and soft scoop ice cream they do an awful lot of air in there and that helps to do the structure and uh, makes it cheaper to produce um, but it's still sold at the same price if you want something low fat this example on the left from the university of birmingham at the time is how you can remove the fat and replace it with uh, an air filled emulsion and then on the right a product where low salt is the other uh, target of many things and, and this is a product from uh, soda called soda low from emanate which is actually um, salt, hollow salt crystals. So the flavor you get from the salt is all on the surface. It's a surface effect, but you don't have the mass of salt. So you get the same flavor hit for less actual salt. Um, so how you can use air um, to actually formulate and solve some problems. 
Another one that is close to my heart coming from how you could use spores and how you can start to put things into spores. And this is Sporomex technology, evacuated pollen spores, natural and renewable, very stable to heat and to um, various physical treatments. And they're released by pressure. So you can imagine something being trapped inside of the spore. And then when you put some pressure on it, perhaps in a cosmetics, then you release whatever has been trapped inside of the spore. Um, and that's from a company called Sporimex. Um, not too sure how active they are at the moment, but I'm sure you can find that out if you're interested. But there are other technologies around spores and evacuated spores and how you can fill, th fill them. Um, so if you are interested, please get in touch. And then, of course, formulators can cheat. And that's probably not a good thing to say, but you can mitigate is a more technical way of doing it. So if you have something that is causing the stability problem or causing instability, then you can often package around that. So that's why blister packs are there. If something is um, there for humidity or has an issue with um, air, or oxygen or has an issue even sometimes with light then why not put it in a blister pack or put it into a brown bottle and then this was another one where um, which was relevant to the industry in terms of drinks where there was a, an issue with the powder and a company in Sweden I believe had come up with this two function closure where the the solid was actually stored in the top of the cap and when you twisted it to release it then was dropped into the liquid and then you had a a freshly made drink, I guess, was the principle. Um, so the stability issue between the, the solid powder and the liquid was mitigated by packaging uh, or cheating, whichever way you want to do it. So I wanted to end and I will end today with really um, saying that probiotic stabilization is, is not alone. Um, there are parallels in other industries such as pharma, agrochem, cosmetics, textiles, synthetic colours. Uh, if you look at Jim's revisited presentation uh, about natural colours, you'll see how liposomes there are used in textiles and in synthetic colours. Um, we advised people to look at what the, the actual mechanism was, the physical chemical mechanism, and that, that might help them with their own problem if they understand the mechanism. And, and trying to look at what you can do to look for those stability channels, uh, challenges, you obviously this was a, a conference or a, a congress trade show, um, but you can read trade publications, scientific journals, or there, are, there were and still are a lot of open innovation events and seminars and networking uh, sessions for people to go to. So as a conclusion, other industries can be approaching the same challenge as you. Um, look at that. Don't be blinkered. Don't stay in the same silo appreciate from formulation that there is a language there colloids particles emulsions encapsulation and people do the same manufacturing one and uh, adapt and perfect i think was a, a phrase that had been used at the congress and i thought it was quite uh, quite relevant here so that's all for today um, i hope you've enjoyed this i formulate revisited um, it went down well at the time um, i think that Almost all of the messages are still relevant. Um, I enjoyed giving the presentation. The workshop went well, and I hope that you've enjoyed this presentation. So all that remains is for me to say um, stay safe and uh, goodbye. Yeah.